So I'll start now and uh, hopefully more people will join in as we go. Uh, so good evening and welcome to the Rectory Study Group. And we're looking at the topic of reconciliation. Um, tomorrow officially starts uh, National Reconciliation Week. Um, and today is National Sorry Day. Uh, recalling uh, Kevin Rudd, I think it was at the time, uh, making a formal apology on uh, for the stolen generation. And I thought with that in mind, uh, we would dis I would discuss reconciliation. Uh, I'm not I'm not specifically focusing on uh, reconciliation in the uh, Australian context. Um, and in terms of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities or any of those sorts of things. But uh, what, what, I'm, what I want is I want you to sort of think of that as the example that sits alongside the rest of the conversation. So hopefully that's a, a way to, to talk about it and think about it. So, so we're going to talk about reconciliation. But I want to start with a prayer. It's the Rainbow Prayer, and it was written by the Reverend Robin Davis, who's a member of NATIAC. Uh, and um, we'll start there. Now, if you've got the notes, which I posted on Facebook, uh, it's all written there. So, dear loving Lord, creator of all, you created us all in your own image. One image, many colors. One image, many cultures. You made us come together like a rainbow, separate parts, but coming together in one creation. Help us to see the beauty you have created in each and every one of us. Dear loving Lord, we are your creation. Hear the cries of your people. You gave us ears to hear and eyes to see. Open our eyes to what you want us to see. Help us always to look to you to see the wisdom of your ways. Dear loving Lord, Creator of all, you gave us hearts to lie, love and minds to reason. Help us to understand our differences and grow in love for each other. Help us to come together as the rainbow comes together, one color, many colors, shining as one creation over all the earth, as you intended us to be. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, um, the reason I actually, if you, there are a number of prayers that people have written around the topic of reconciliation. Uh, and the reason I like that one is it actually creates a theological uh, framework for the understanding of this, the word reconciliation. Uh, once again, if you've got the notes, I just grabbed the, um, the Google etymology of reconciliation. And... Uh, I, I like to look at the etymology of a word just to sometimes see where it comes from and how it gets to, to, to where we are today. And reconciliation is comes from the re, or back, uh, conciliare, bringing to, to back, bring together. So to bring back together. Um, and reconcile then becomes uh, the, the term that's used. And so in the prayer, that, that um, the rainbow prayer, we have this, the returning to togetherness. If the, um, and, that's, and the reason I mention that is that it, to reconcile, you have to have an idea of, a, of an origin together, a starting together point. And so in that prayer, the starting together point is that all humanity is created in one image, the image and likeness of God, obviously, which reflects the Genesis uh, story, story for want of a better word. And so it works in that regard. Uh, and then this year's theme in this together also works to that extent. Now, in the... Um, Kind of in the Christian circles, we often look at the the Genesis story as this, I'm going to say this idea that what happens is uh, 
uh, in the story of Adam and Eve, God creates, you know, Garden of Eden, and then man sins, and then as punishment, we are kicked out of the garden, and that it's 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 a story about punishment. Um, but there is another way of looking at it, and I. You know, I can't remember who put this on to me onto this. Um, otherwise, I'd reference them. But there are some people, uh, say within the Jewish community, um, but not necessarily just the Jewish community, uh, who will look at the arc of Scripture, and what they will see and what they say is there is this arc in which uh, humanity is slowly but surely being brought back to. And reconciled with God but not reconciled having forgotten our history so so we start in kind of this theoretical innocence and we mature and we reconcile as adults if you will and so so that's the the story of of the reconciliation in that regard um, and that idea took me to um, an article by Rabbi Shoshona Gelfand. I, it's wonderful the things you can find. Who, um, who, who in her article um, looks at the a number of the Jewish traditional festivals and sees in those an ark. And in, in the Christian tradition, we actually have a fairly similar kind of structure that starts with, if you will, Ash Wednesday, takes us up to Good Friday, uh, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, the resurrection, and then propels us into, uh, through the season of Easter, to Pentecost. And so we have an arc. It's not an arc of reconciliation, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a long arc of the festivals that talks about uh, the story. So that idea, but in the Jewish tradition. Um, and, and she works her way through this article. Now, in the notes, you have a, an abbreviated form of that article. I've, I've grabbed extracts and trimmed back substantially. But I've also put a link there. So if you want to go and have a read of the article, uh, I found it fascinating. Definitely worth a read if you have the time. So it starts with um, the 17th of Tammuz, uh, and Rabbi Shoshana says, On this day we committed the sin of communal adultery, uh, and declaring it was not God who redeemed us from Egypt, but a golden calf. And so obviously that's um, referencing the Exodus uh, story, uh, and as e Israel escapes Egypt, uh, and then they get to... Um, uh, the mountain and Moses at the top of the mountain and, and they uh, the people create their own God uh, then the next thing that rem that they remember is the destruction of the temple now in this case the destruction of the temple is not the destruction of the temple uh, in 70 AD it's the destruction of the first temple when the Babylonians came into Jerusalem uh, destroyed the temple and took the, the Jewish people into exile. And the temple is a symbol of the closeness of God with the people of Israel. And so remembering the destruction of the temple remembers the experience of being left utterly alone. So part of the journey to reconciliation is the recognition of the separation. So, and and recognizing that the pain of the set the the separation Elul, which is the beginning of the month which precedes Rosh Hashanah um, is a time of reflection uh, so I actually think in a lot of ways that has an echo if you will with Lent uh, where we prepare for and we reflect on our own lives and our own journeys um, so we, we kind of have that self-reflective process built in um, uh, as they prepare for Teshuvah, uh, the returning to God. Rosh Hashanah, um, 
uh, sort of the start of the new year and having engaged in reflection i think this is really important having engaged in reflection um they're able to focus on the three themes of rosh hashanah um and those would be sovereignty covenant and redemption now in this context it's it's sovereignty the sovereignty of god the remembrance of the covenant with god and god's revelation and pro promise of redemption but as i said we could kind of look at the example of uh some of the stuff that happens in that has happened in the australian context and conversations around sovereignty obviously are very significant uh as that religious language is um, taken over into the political sphere and we talk about a people's sovereignty their capacity to self-govern covenant um you know uh the other word for that might be treaty and uh, we could perhaps think of uh the song by yota yindi um and redemption is is paying of debt and and it would be you know uh, australia has a fairly uh, patchy history at best with with uh, the way we've uh, you know and the example I'm thinking of in my mind is the uh, quarantined isn't that an appropriate choice of term at this time the quarantined salaries that went to uh, many of the Aboriginal workers that were quarantined uh, quite strongly such that they never actually received them and uh, one of the things that many of the people these days are working towards is is a redemption to be repaid for the work that was done. So, um, uh, the next thing is the 10 days. Between the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's the opportunity to move towards reconciliation. And what I loved about this is, a, is the, the, the statement that's just really there. Of course, there's no way to reconcile with God until we have made amends with those made in God's image. Uh, and it's really important to, to recognize that part of what's going on there is that, you know, we, we can't, rec it's, it is impossible to reconcile with God uh, and not at least reach out to those made in God's image. You can't. You can't reach out to God and not also reach out to those made in God's image. It just uh, doesn't work that way. Um, and it's good to just kind of highlight that. Uh, the Day of Atonement uh, raises the question of whether we will be reunited, forgiven and reunited with God. Um, and uh, we reflect on how we as human beings can act in ways that will bring God closer instead of driving God away. And um, uh, I think there of uh, John Howard's resistance to saying sorry and how that drove a, a wedge between sort of european australia and aboriginal australia i'm not happy with those terms but you know what i mean i hope um and, and it happens all over the place you know um but it's an important question that uh thing to to kind of take on board that reconciliation has built into it uh, action you know it's it's about change after that we have uh, Sukkot Sukkot um, where and I get the idea is you sort of you build a hut or a tent that reminds you reminds people of Israel uh, Jews that they you know that they have this history of being the people who uh, traveled through the desert and during that time uh, they invite people into their tents sometimes real people and sometimes they'll invite moses and isaiah and, and some of the mythic uh peace people from their past and i use the word mythic in terms of in a sense larger than life um you know uh, if you think of the way even say paul impacts on the church uh, in one sense he's just a guy who was writing some letters two thousand years ago but his impact is huge and so he has that kind of mythic impact um, but it's, 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 yeah, and there's kind of this rejoicing that they, they're traveling again with God. Uh, and finally, or they recall that they traveled, 
And finally, um, Simshat Torah, uh, the holiday is the climax of the spiritual journey. And it invokes dedication imagery. Uh, and it's kind of wedding imagery. And the question is, will God dwell with us and mark the repair of this relationship? And so we kind of get this big communal liturgical set of actions around uh, around the journey towards reconciliation. Um, and there's some very important steps there for us to take in, in, in kind of really practical in a way. Um, for, for these big liturgical things, there's often a, a sort of a very practical structure behind. And that's some really practical stuff there. And it's worth thinking about. Now, for the most part, that's primarily focused on reconciliation with God, a people's reconciliation with God. And often scripturally, that's the place where we look uh, when we're talking about um, uh, reconciliation. We look to the reconciliation with God. And partially that's because uh, Scripture doesn't necessarily uh, um, focus on uh, reconciliation with peoples as its primary concern. The primary concern is reconciliation with God. But I do want to come to a, um, a New Test Testament example. And the obvious example to look at, and I, I do think in one sense it's an obvious example, is to look at the, uh, uh, Jesus' parable of uh, the prodigal son. The story of the son who goes away, who breaks his father's heart, goes away, uh, squanders all that he has, and then returns. You know, that, that, and, and is welcomed back into the home. Uh, and I can understand why we would think that, but I actually want to take a different tact. Now, there are reasons why I don't think that parable is entirely about reconciliation. Uh, and um, if you're curious, I would look at a work by um, Amy Jill Levine, uh, who explores some of the parables of Jesus. Uh, very interesting. And she kind of breaks that down in a way that makes me wonder if we should be thinking of it as a parable about reconciliation, uh, certainly reconciliation with God. Instead, what I want to do is I want to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I've got it there uh, from, uh, from Luke chapter 10. And it's the NIV version, the New International Version. On one occasion... An expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the reason that I'm focusing on this is because of this word neighbor. And it's a word that we often think of as uh, our neighbor is the person who lives just next to us. But perhaps that shouldn't be the way we think of it. So um, often in the, you know, in kind of in the suburbs, uh, your neighbor next door to you is kind of like you, you know, um, they, they might be a little bit different, but they're not hugely different. They'll speak a very similar language. They'll have a very similar cultural background. Um, our, our next door neighbor doesn't impact significantly on us as people. Isn't this constant um, cultural uh, abrasive that makes us question what's going on with the world, question our, our identity, question our, our language, question our food, question everything. Um, and script, But scripturally, that's not your neighbor. <laughs> they, 
your, your neighbor is the person who is different, who is, you know, um, an alien in the land, if you will, is, is a person who, who does perhaps speak a different language, who, who eats a different food, who looks different, has different culture. And uh, so, so I, what I've got there is I've actually picked up from Leviticus chapter 19. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying very deliberately to, to draw from both Old and New Testament for, for this evening. And in Leviticus chapter 19, it's a set of instructions. And it says, do not def defraud or rob your neighbor. Now that makes you know, some sense if your neighbor's just next door. Because um, you know, they're going to be right there, they're going to remember. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear, the, fear your God, I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Now, the reason I highlighted that text is it actually indicates that the neighbor is traditionally in that category, the, the hired worker, the one who perhaps can't, you know, you can't even hold their wages overnight because then they won't have any dinner. Um, never mind uh, for the next day or anything like that. Um, you know, they're in the same category as the deaf uh, or the blind. Uh, and, and so the neighbor is this one who impedes on your sense of kind of the uniformity of humanity by their very difference. And yet scripturally, they are to be loved as we are. Now, it's not my next door neighbor, I must love my next door neighbor as much as I love myself. I must love my next door neighbor who, who is different to me as much as I love and value those who are the same as me. You, you can see how the, the, the neighbor is a very different to the next door neighbor. So anyway, love your neighbor as yourself, says the, the teacher of the law, the expert in the law. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. This man, who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, so he's traveling from the place of holiness to uh, home, perhaps, uh, is attacked. And we immediately understand that, in fact, if the expert in the law is going to be empathetic with anyone in the story, if the expert in the law is going to be recognize themselves in any character, it's the man who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, who's perhaps just been to the temple. He's just been in the temple. Uh, but And yet, we just find out that he's attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Obviously, uh, nudity is an issue, uh, far more for them even than for us. Um, uh, and, the, you you know, just being beaten half dead is not a good sign at all. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. So what we're getting is we're getting those who should be loving to their next door neighbor are not showing love to their next door neighbor. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and he saw him and took pity on him. So um, Samaritans and Jews, yeah, famously, they didn't necessarily get along very well. They weren't constantly um, conflicted with each other, but there was a fair degree of mistrust. Um, it's not racism, because they weren't, but it's culturalism. It's culturalism, not racism. Uh, and the two are very closely connected. Um, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Uh, and the, the, the passage there that I think that's um, worth thinking about is Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. The Samaritans were the outcasts of Israel to a certain extent. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So in this psalm, 
we see that the good Samaritan who is being already in a sense gathered up by God is doing the work of God by binding the wounds of the man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. We're getting the, the, the Samaritan being elevated by his own actions in terms of how they reflect the actions of God. Um, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which is roughly two days wages, uh, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And so we see uh, a generosity. The Samaritan isn't looking to be reimbursed. It's not, a, it's not an economic thing. It's in fact a de-economizing. He's taking money that he's earned, perhaps through trading or whatever, uh, and he's throwing it away. He's, he's, he's not asking for anything in return. He is sacrificing his money uh, for someone else. He is de-economizing his labor, his time, whatever. He's giving it freely. And then Jesus asks the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Fair question. And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. You notice he can't even quite say the Samaritan? He knows. He knows. Uh, but he can't say it. So, so all, all, all he has to say is the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Um, now, the reason I think that story is so important. Oh, uh, I also wanted to bring in uh, one of my favorite verses, Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That's about acting with mercy. Um, and so we see that, again, the Samaritan, the one who, in a sense, isn't the right person, is the one who is acting in the most godly way. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's something that's perhaps difficult. Um, I chose an image there by, that I found online um, called The Good Samaritan by Dinah Rowe Kendall. And I quite liked it because uh, in the picture you can sort of see heading down the road um, sort of a, a loyally type person, a priestly type person, uh, and you can see a, a white guy beaten up. And you can see a black person looking after them. Now, looking at the costumes, maybe, you know, uh, I'm, I'm picturing, you know, like the Father Brown type era or something like that. Um, maybe not, maybe earlier. But part of it that's interesting is that in the story, the person who represents the dominant culture, the, the one with uh, social clout, the one who's um, able to have influence in society, all three of them, in fact, so the expert in the law, the Levite and the priest, are actually cast as as the ones most in need of help, as the ones most in need of, of being thanked, of being, uh, not of being thanked, of being, of being helped, of being rescued. They're the most vulnerable to, to thieves and robbers. Um, and, and the one who is, historically is, has the least power is, is um, in the most difficulty, is the one who, at the end, seems to be the most godlike and have the most to offer in teaching and if we are going to talk about a society built on judeo-christian values of reconciliation then we need to be serious about reconciliation rather than um say for example tolerance tolerance and reconciliation are not the same thing um tolerance is putting up with uh, you know, if um, thinking, you know, if your next door neighbour uh, 
um, you know, likes to play loud music and you don't like it, like their music, but you just go, eh, I'll put up with it. I'll tolerate it. That's not reconciliation. Reconciliation might be talking to your next door neighbor and perhaps even learning to appreciate their music or uh, at least learning what they can teach you about their music or perhaps just coming to a place where you can uh, appreciate the differences. And But it's not tolerance. It's, it's something different. And it starts from a place of recognizing the vulnerability uh, and when I say recognizing, perhaps that means that's being forced to recognize, uh, as the as the teacher of the law was, the vulnerability and the need of those who are culturally dominant to actually learn from and to receive the what can be taught by those who who are not. So kind of coming back to the fact that this is the start of uh, National Reconciliation Week. Um, for me, it's about reconciliation kind of in the church and spirituality context is about taking seriously very seriously what it is that um, aboriginal and torres strait islander people have to teach the church about authentic australian spirituality and we can only do that if we listen uh, it's about taking seriously concerns about how do we create a church that isn't just um, kind of an English or an American church, as most of the, our churches in Australia are. They're either basically English, Catholic, or kind of an American church that's come to Australia. How do we create an authentically Australian church? Um, and uh, so that's the question there that I think we need to struggle with and listen through uh, in order to kind of create some level of reconciliation. We also obviously need to own our past. We need to change the way we treat people. Uh, we need to take seriously the agency of, of others. Uh, and all that kind of comes from the estrangement to reconciliation stuff uh, from Rabbi Shoshana. Uh, I feel like that was a lot of information I threw out there. Um, uh, so if anyone's got any thoughts or questions that you want to quickly put up on text, um, I'll just see if I can deal with them. Uh, otherwise, um, I'll leave them. Just a reminder that if you want the notes, um, they're on Facebook. I just posted a link to them at around 6 o'clock. Uh, and they'll also be on the on Good Shepherd website uh, under Sermons and Series. And I'll also transfer this video to there at some stage. Ah. I'm not seeing any questions come up. Uh, I hope that we get, gave you some grist for the old thinking mill. And I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>